So welcome to another Code Buddies Show and Tell Twitch stream. Uh, this week we're going to explore the world of 3D graphics with Chris Cadero. But before I start, I'd like to thank a couple of our sponsors for Code Buddies. We've got GitDuck, which is a video chat tool for developers. We've got Netlify, the fastest way to build the fastest sites. And of course, we've got DigitalOcean, the developer-friendly cloud. Um, not only do our sponsors help us make the community possible, they also provide great tools for developers. So I encourage you all to go check these out um, after the stream, of course, not not now. <laughs> so Chris, uh, welcome to this Code Buddies show and tell. Uh, do you, you want to give us a little bit of an intro? Tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, so my name's Chris, um, as Bill said. Uh, I am a software engineer. I'm based out of New York City, uh, around the area. I've uh, been an engineer for uh, more than a few years now. And um, most recently, uh, I've been working on this uh, built from scratch uh, uh, video game engine, which part of it that I've been working on for the past uh, couple of months has been solely dedicated to the 3D graphics side of things. So happy to show it off today. Awesome, awesome. It's, a, it was, it's quite interesting. I think it was back at the start of September, you shared that animated GIF not GIF, GIF, in the <laughs> in the Code Buddy Slack channel, um, and it showed um, two cubes, one kind of orbiting the other. Um, yeah. there was a little bit more to it than that. There was shading, there was lighting, there was motion, and 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 all this. It may have looked like a simple GIF, but there's clearly a lot of hard work that's gone into it. Mm -hmm. Can you take us back to the beginning and and sort of tell us where it all began? What, what, why did you start picking this up? Honestly, it kind of began when I first picked up coding to begin with, I, uh, one of the first things that I ever worked on uh, for myself uh, and to, to learn coding is uh, I worked on a video game. I think the very first game that I ever, or the very first program I ever wrote was a clone of Pong. Uh, so I learned a little bit about, you know, uh, how to render something to the screen through that, how to use an update loop, things like that. Uh, from there, I also built uh, you know, another thing called like a Flappy Bird clone. Uh, so uh, again, I'm, these are just like my first touches into game development in, in general. But so I've, I've always just been super interested in this space. Uh, I wanted to get into 3D graphics and I wanted to make my own engine because uh, for one, because I'm crazy and I just want to learn, uh, you know, how this all works under the hood. It would have been so easy to download one of the uh, big free, like open source um, game engines these days. Uh, Godot is a great one that I've that uh, that I've heard of, and I've actually tinkered with a little bit. But uh, you know, every the whole time I'm, I'm, I was just endlessly curious about how it is that I I call this function that says draw. And then all of a sudden, like these beautiful pictures come up on screen. I'm like, how does that happen? And I just wanted to learn. Uh, so I, I, I just, uh, I, I ended up picking up a few textbooks. Uh, one of them is game, uh, game engine architecture. And another one is 3D, what is it? I actually have it here. Uh, mathematics for 3D game programming and computer graphics. Uh, I started going through them and I just started implementing uh, and I haven't stopped learning since. <laughs> I love that you've gone straight for mathematics. <laughs> so how do you learn to code? And you've gone straight for the second book you mentioned is mathematics. Um, but you remind me actually of you said uh, you said implementing uh, a clone of Pong, and uh, you remind me of some of the early days I started uh, started coding, and it was. Um, my, my dad had a laptop. I wouldn't call it a laptop these days. It was more like a truck on wheels. Um, <laughs> but the only the only programming language I knew about that it had was was some form of BASIC. I think it was QBASIC. It might have been even Quick BASIC. Mm -hmm. And um, that was that was my start. And it was like taking apart the games that came with it. And can I wire this up to joysticks? Can I change the control inputs? And uh, but that's me going right the way back to to BASIC days, <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, have, did you start in a particular language, and have you stuck with that as you've as you've developed this, or have you um, sort of evolved the tool set that you're using as you as you've approached this? So uh, the first few programs I wrote were in Python. Uh, there's a library called Pygame, which, if there's anybody watching that might uh, be interested in getting started with game engines and and game dev and, and graphics, uh, you could start there. Uh, Pygame is mostly like two uh, two D graphics though, so. Uh, a lot of stuff I'm talking about today probably won't apply, but 
Uh, yeah, I started off with Python and I used Python for a pretty substantial portion of my career as both like as a hobby and as, a, as an actual software engineer. Um, but recently I've been uh, jumping into other languages, uh, more low level languages, because that's kind of what you need when you're trying to create performance software. And so uh, the engine that I'm building right now uh, is written in Rust which is um, kind of like the new hotness for, uh, for systems level uh, programming. Uh, it's got a lot of buzz on the internet. And um, honestly, I, I love Rust. So uh, I picked that over C and C++, which is usually the default, uh, the default languages for game programming. And is this your first foray into Rust? You decided to, to instead of Hello World, you jumped in with Hello 3D Graphics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you know what? Uh, actually, not yeah. too far from the truth. <laughs> not too far from the truth. I, uh, I like. I think I read the Rust book. There, in the Rust book is amazing. Uh, and then I started building some small stuff. Got really um, in the weeds with its lifetimes and borrow checker. And then at some point, I'm like, oh, I need a project for Rust so I can just continue working in Rust because I love it. Uh, let's just build a game engine. <laughs> so, so hello, game engine. It is. <laughs> awesome awesome so uh that that really does bring us to to game engine um did you can you talk us through a little bit about how you approach game engine is it straight in at 3d graphics or did you start with some other components first before you before you hit on the the graphics component i uh it's, it's kind of funny that uh, this is actually uh and i'm glad you asked that i I'm, I'm in the the first rewrite already of the engine because I started off with other things uh, like you lead to. I started off with seeing if I could just render text to the screen. Uh, and I started off with like, how do I manage inputs from the uh, from the keyboard? How do I manage inputs from a mouse? How, how, like I wanted, I wrote like a small little uh, subsystem for uh, playing audio through someone's speakers. Um, really, really like, everything to the side of it. I even wrote a really small like homegrown math library because um, as you might imagine uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with game engines, you're, you're working a lot with like geometry and three, 3D math, like linear, uh, linear algebra. So I made my own little like homegrown library using the books that I've, I've been reading. Uh, and then I started trying to write the, the renderer part of my engine and uh, it was kind of painful, like the, like the, uh, I don't know why, but like my, my design for the, for the engine made it painful to include this renderer. Like there was difference, there was uh, issues with how, you know, game state needed to be held. There was a misunderstanding of like what kinds of pieces of data needs to actually get sent to the, to the graphics processing unit. Uh, and so I got a little frustrated with it and I ended up just rewrite, like rewriting it from scratch. I'm going to, I'm going to start with the renderer first, uh, and then, uh, probably like get cherry pick some, some, uh, details back from, from, uh, when I implemented the inputs and audio and things like that. So, uh, so yeah. So you mentioned the, the run loop, um, mm -hmm. it, it, is this, I think in the early games I, I'd looked at, there was, and, and many of the stuff that you get in, in learn to code type tutorials and, and some of the stuff particularly targeted at kids where you have, um, I forget the name of it, the, the drag and drop blocks that you, you can arrange into, into components like that, that form a program. Vis visual programming is the, is the theme. There's a, there's a really popular one, which I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, it might be an MIT thing, uh, brain fade. Um, yeah. But the they always they always come wrapped in a in a big for loop, and essentially what you what you end up doing is is making things happen within a loop that just goes round and round and round and round. Is this run mm -hmm. loop that you you talk about the same sort of thing, the same idea that it's just continuously inside a loop, and then everything you're trying to do has to fit within that? Yeah. Uh yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, every single game has to have one of these. Even the big AAA games that you might you might uh, play right now on your console or or on on Steam or something. Every game has to have a game loop. Um, it's all it's typically a while loop, and there's at the the highest level. Uh, 
there's uh, basically uh, a few steps that have to always run. There's a update step where you update state, which is uh, things like, where's the player character? Are there projectiles actually being shot at him? Uh, where are those where are those in space? Uh, where are the enemies in space? Uh, is he is the player character you know in a town or is he in the middle of a forest or something like that? Game state. Uh, you know, it's uh, as you you have to update those game states. There's a um, oh, I'm sorry. For that, there's also a uh, input processing state uh, step where you have to uh, you know parse the the stream of information coming from the user's peripherals, whether or not that's like a controller or a keyboard, and try to translate that into what that means in your game, like. So, okay, the, the player press W, does that mean go forward or does that mean go back or does that mean jump? Uh, you know, they press the A button. What does that mean exactly? So there's like a, a step where you do that. And then again, you, you update the state. And then finally you call, uh, you, you draw to the screen. Uh, the interesting thing about 3D graphics is that you have to draw to the screen and this game loop has to happen uh, 60 times a second. If, uh, if you go below that, then you then the experience starts to degrade. Uh, if you go below like 30, um, it starts getting choppy and people start um, really disliking your game. So it's 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 uh, it's pretty important that you are that everything, whether or not it's it's uh, processing those inputs of like actually like affecting the entire game and then rendering, um, it all needs to happen uh, extremely quickly. Uh, and, and, and consistently uh, too, no matter what's happening on screen. Like uh, they could just be in a quiet room or it could be like big explosions happening everywhere. It's interesting because the, the for loop is the is the one thing that we're, we're told to keep as you kind of start to learn programming. You're told to keep those tight, right? The for loop is a way you can very quickly sort of balloon into slow running programs. But uh, the same principle sounds like it applies, right? You need to keep the loop tight. Because if you're going to hit yeah. 60 frames a second, there's not much you can do in the loop. But there's still a lot you're trying to achieve. You've mentioned mm -hmm. the kind of input handling. You've mentioned the the sound. You've mentioned the uh, the renderer, which I'm hoping we can hear a little bit more about. But that's a lot going on. Um, how did you sort of approach that challenge of not just have a really, really slow loop? Well, uh, I have a few uh, advantages right now. One is I don't have a AAA game uh, yet. Like it's just it is, this is like the like baby's first uh, game engine, I guess. So there isn't a lot that needs to happen. The game the game state that needs to update is pretty small. So so there's that, and then the rendering itself. Uh, like when I show you the cube and the, the two cubes floating around each other, it's like it's there's not a lot of uh, like rendering primitives that actually need to get rendered to the screen. So. Uh, so it's a it's a data quantity issue. There, there. I haven't really come up to a performance problem yet. Uh, but what I do know is that uh, when you do get into like the AAA stuff, like building really massive games, uh, you have to really start worrying about threading, um, multi-processing. Uh, uh, I've I've seen architectures where they might have a thread dedicated specifically to rendering. Um, while another thread might be processing uh, game state, for example. Uh, and so uh, they'll have like a pipeline of, of threads and join points where they just come fan out processing, come back together to, to realize where they're at and then fan, fan out again and do that many times or just a few times within a given game loop iteration. So it's, it's, a, it's a performance problem once you reach that kind of scale. But it's a good problem to have because if you're writing a AAA game, you, you you feel like you're doing all right, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I can get there with this with this, this engine someday. We'll see. Awesome. So, do you want to do you want to take us through the the renderer a bit and and look at some of the th the how you approach the the three D graphics? Sure, I'd love to. Let's see. So, I guess I'll share my screen. Okay. So let's uh, let me show you first the um, the end state, like what what I was showing you guys uh, in the GIF. So if I run this program here, uh, this is very simple. I've got a, I've got something that processes inputs. So if I press like a WASD shift or space, I can move the camera around and pivot uh, and 
you know, so you can see this cube at different angles. Um, I've got this cube here, which is obviously textured. It looks like a, like a, like a set of bricks. And then I've got this light source, which is also in the shape of a cube just because it was easy, uh, but also I was following a tutorial. And you can kind of see that the light is actually being cast on this cube uh, in, um, in a somewhat realistic uh, way, I would hope. Uh, there's, you've you've yeah. got the reflections coming through as well. So you've got the, the kind of reflection off the cube coming back, which seems to work. Right, right, yeah. There's like, it's called specular lighting. So, so yeah, there's, there's so much stuff happening here. And I, I want to spend a little time to talk about what is actually happening in this scene, just so that way that it makes more sense when I kind of walk through the code a little bit. So, uh, and by the way, this is going to be pretty basic stuff. Uh, I, there's, you know, there's like a, there's so many, so much stuff to uh, 3D programming that, uh, that there's no way I could like get through all of it or even all of it correctly. So I hope I don't make too many mistakes explaining it. Uh, and also before I finish, some people might uh, in the Rust community might actually recognize this, this program. This is, uh, I kind of learned how to do this, uh, do this program from a tutorial uh, called Learn WGPU. Uh, WGPU is the graphics API that I'm using uh, to talk to my graphics card. So uh, yeah, so with all that, let's talk about this. Uh, so um, the data for this object is, ha is all stored in a set of uh, vertices in, in space. A, vertice, a vertex is like just a point. So a three, three, a three D point in space, and it's um, a surface is subdivided into triangles. So in any like three D graphics engine, it is built to handle triangles because triangles uh, make up uh, like the, the simplest surface you can you can have. So this like this cube on its own has a lot of data in it, uh, and like hundreds, maybe does I don't know about hundreds, but maybe dozens of of vertexes just baked into it on its own. And it and my program is like shoveling all that data to my graphics card to process. Uh, if I can just make a quick, if I can show you guys what it looks like, uh, there's this uh, file here, like a, it's called an OBJ file. And this is actually the, the description of what the cube looks like under the hood. It's uh, for every line in here, it's a 3D point and V means vertex. So like, if you can imagine like a 3D coordinate plane, like in, on the screen, every single one of these points is a point on this, on this cube. And together these vertexes are, oops, uh, together these vertexes um, are organized in a way that uh, like triplets of them make up triangles. Hope that so makes it's sense. not just, yeah, it, it, I was just going to ask you, it's not just the, the eight vertices of the cube itself. Mm -hmm. These represent triangles, as it were, that, that actually make up the texture of the cube that we're looking at. Is that what you're, you're saying? That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, that's right. The, 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 the reason why triangles are used, because, I mean, this is just a cube, so it's pretty simple, but you can imagine that something much more uh, interesting, like, say, a globe or, like, a, a human being or you know, um, something, some complex, uh, you know, object with curves on it. Uh, each, like you can't actually create a smooth surface with dots and points very easily. And so what you do is you do this thing called tessellation where, um, where you keep chopping it into smaller and smaller and finer and finer triangles. And the more tessellation you have, the more you can actually like encompass that curve or that or the the actual shape of the object you're building this is just a cube so this is there's not much to it uh, i got this file i got this file from the tutorial and it came in it's already pretty high fidelity and like look at all these vertices there's 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 a lot i think this is like a uh, a pretty basic object to like start with um so yeah so there's that um there's the the cube itself is texture there's a thing called a texture map so if I was to say open this again, and if I was to open uh, this image, there's like there's this image here, which is a JPEG, oops, which is like a bitmapped image. You can think of it like 
if, imagine this is like a also a, a 2D coordinate plane where there's like X and Y and each one of these points is a, is a point. Uh, at every point in this image, it's a, there's like a, there's a piece of information for what color it is at that point. And what you can do with graphics engines is you can kind of drape an image over a set of vertices that kind of like project this image onto the cube. Does that make sense? Like the basically, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. But, uh, the, the, the question I've got is, it's, I can I can see a texture in in the text you're showing it it's a looks like a perfect square um and I in my head can't fathom how to wrap a perfect square around a cube and so I, what I'm wondering is is it is it literally doing the draping or the wrapping it around or is it just sort of trying to take and mirror a similar style of texture or pattern onto the surface that you've you've rendered uh, you know, the way I think of it is that it is actually draping. It's like you're, it's like you've got this cube and then you've got um, your Christmas wrapping paper and you're going to just wrap this thing uh, nicely. Uh, obviously, there's no folds in it, but uh, the way that the graphics card um, handles, handles like the imperfections is that it does a lot of interpolations of, of the, the, the bits uh, and, the, and the color like vertices. So it kind of smooths I, I out think that now makes sense. And as you as you're describing that and, and zooming into to the cube, what the one thing that was kind of making me ask the question was, I don't see any sort of sharp edges where it doesn't perfectly fit. But on the the top left uh, edge of the cube, you can see the line where it's it's done a little bit of the um, I, I forget the term you used just there, but the smoothing type thing. Yeah. Uh, but you can still see the line. Yeah. For sure. And there's like a there's a there's a thing where the textures, I'm talking a little bit out of my own here. There's a thing where like textures, you can configure it to either like stretch to fit to fit the space that it can't like reach, or do you have it like repeat? Or, you know, there's like a, there's a way that it kind of maps it onto the, to the object. So. Um, no, it's, to me, this is, this is amazingly clever is you take the structure and then you wrap it with a texture. I, yeah. I had initially assumed that the, the object file of vertices that you showed us included all of the little lumps and bumps and stuff that I'm seeing. And actually some of that visual, um, the kind of visual impact may come from the texture as well and not just the vertices. So I think it's, it's, it's beautifully clever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that's basically the cube in a nutshell. I'll come back to something else called the normal map afterwards, but I want to talk about this, this light. So, uh, you know, light is light. I mean, everybody knows what light is. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that this light is projecting outwards from its position towards the cube. Well, actually towards in every direction, but for this, it's towards the cube. Uh, and so in your graphics engine, you're, you have to, to calculate what, like the, the effect of the light on the cube. If that makes uh, if that makes any sense, uh, there is a there is an algorithm uh, called the Blin Fong model, and the Blin Fong model is like a way to how do I say this? It's a way to calculate the effect of light on objects without literally simulating billions of particles of light. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, in your in your game engine, because like you know, if if you had like a a fantasy computer that could do that, you could create hyper realistic um, you know images, uh, you know, by by literally having billions of light particles being being simulated, but you can't. So uh, this blend Fong model is like a like game programmers are basically cheating uh, to to do it. There's there's uh, three different types of lighting that's happening in this um, in this scene. There's something called ambient lighting, diffuse lighting, and specular lighting. Uh, ambient lighting is what happens when there is no light shining on it. So if I come down like below the below the um, the cube, you can see that this, this bottom doesn't ever really get shined on because the uh, because the light is above. 
but you can kind of still see the details. Why is that? Like you would think normally like just like the, the area around it, it might be just totally black because uh, there's no light shining on it. But uh, when light enters into a room, like it kind of bounces around and kind of maybe slightly illuminates uh, certain surfaces. So the way that a game programmer um, might, you know, simulate ambient lighting is to just take all the surfaces and just raise all the raise the raise the light level by like a small amount. Uh, that's it. No, 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 uh, no extra, you know, calculations on top of it. It's it's the base level of light, as it were. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just the yeah, base level okay. of light. It's like, it's like just just uh, just give it a you know twenty percent. Like that's basically what ambient lighting is in this whole scene. Uh, diffuse lighting is a lot more interesting. So the cube, the, both of these cubes are, are located in, in a coordinate system in space. And there's like, if you can, uh, man, I'm gonna get into a little mathy here, but uh, if you can imagine like a vector pointing toward from this light source at the cube, uh, that, that vector is the, is the direction at which light is being shot at this, at this cube. And if, if a vertex is literally like in direct view of that vector, it should shine the brightest. But if you're, if, if a vertex is a little off from that, from that direction, it should, it should shine, but it shouldn't shine as bright as the one that's literally being spotlighted on. Does that make sense? So uh, there's uh, it's as if there's a, I was going to, I'm going to call it a ray, but if there's something coming out of that center of the, the orbiting cube, and you're basically what you're trying, what you're trying to do is, if that hits a, a vertex directly, then that shines really brightly. If it's yes. slightly off to an angle of that direct line, it's less bright. That's right. Is, is that the, yeah? Okay. Yeah, and that's why you can kind of see like right at the direct like. Um, you know, area that the, the light isn't right in front of, it is the brightest, but areas around it start fading in and out. That's kind of what's happening there. I, that's with the diffuse lighting. And I'm assuming that's where the shadows come from, because as it's rotating around, it's not just the, the surface of the cube itself that's shining brighter or, or less bright. You start to get some of the indentations, which I think come from that, uh, the uh, triangles in that object file. Is that where uh, the, the, kind there's, of, there's, the shadows so in that are coming from? Uh, not quite, because uh, if it was, there was, there's something called a normal map, which I'll, which I can talk about in a second. Uh, but, um, but if you didn't have this normal map, then you, you see how like at this brick, like the edge of this brick here, it kind of like, like the light kind of like hits it and doesn't actually like spill over nice and smoothly. Like it's it kind of looks like there's yeah. an actual yeah. brick there. So that's caused by a normal map. If if the normal map wasn't being used, um, then it would just be like a smooth, as if it was a smooth, completely smooth surface with no friction or anything. Uh, uh, so understood. So that so that um, the the effect of that ray of, of the light coming of the vector coming out of the center of that cube really is just impacting how bright the the kind of fundamental surface of the bigger cube is. Right, and so the the idea of like, how do you know if it's if it's shining directly on a vertex or not, is is uh, you have to use something called a um, a normal vector. Okay, I'm getting a little bit more mathy, but bear with me. If you have got a surf, if you have a surface, uh, if you have a surface, a normal vector is perpendicular to that surface. Uh, let me actually see if this tutorial has something. Um, uh, yeah, so like, okay, so this, uh, this picture that's in this tutorial, there's a surface here. And so this arrow, this vector that points directly up is the, it's, they call it the normal in mathematics. Okay, and then this, this vector is actually the vector towards the light source. So if the, if this sun was like, directly overhead uh, where, where the normal is, then this surface should be the brightest. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And so the the difference between the normal vector to the surface and the vector that points 
directly towards the sun in in the in the picture that you're showing. That angle between them is what determines the brightness of the surface. Yeah, this is like this angle determines um, the reduction of of light intensity. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that sense. Makes yeah. Sense. So yes, you can imagine you, you can imagine that for every vertex, for, for every triplet of vertices, you've got a triangle, and that triangle makes a surface. That surface has a normal. And then for every single surface, as this light is moving around, you have to calculate that angle and determine how much light intensity needs to be applied to the vertices in that surface. And you have to do that in the renderer. You don't just say, dear graphics guard, please do that for me. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you, have, you, have you have to write your own shader to do that. A shader okay. is a program in your graphics, graphics card um, or that you load into your graphics uh, rendering pipeline. Uh, so, so yeah, so the, the, just the last thing I'll say this very quick because, um, because I've been harping on my light for so much, so long, but there's another file called a normal map. And this looks like the original image, but it's bluish. Why is it blue? So for, for, uh, in a, in a normal picture, right. Colors are reflected in three, in three shades. So red, green, blue. So you need you need three three numbers to uh, to determine what a what a color is. Sometimes it's a fourth one for alpha, like transparency. But uh, in general, there's there's three. Uh, in a cube normal, you like what else has three numbers in it? A a vector, a three D vector. So what really clever people have done is they say, okay, let me make another texture map. Fill it up with like colors, but they're actually vectors. And what that means is that what you can do is that for every pixel on this image, you have a triplet of numbers that refer to the normal vector di direction. So that way, as this light is moving around and around and around, you can like, that's how you get these like, these like little nooks and crannies here between um, each of the, each of the bricks. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I think I thought when I when I, I read about that, I thought that was the coolest thing. There's there's a lot to process there. I think the so it, when you show this image, you're doing something. It's not too uncommon, but it's one that you don't necessarily jump to, which I think is using an image format as a, a as a data structure, as it were. So mm -hmm. you're not storing an image in the sense that we might think of a photo. You're storing an image that is actually the colors represent the 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 vectors. Yeah. Um, where, where my head sort of hit a brick wall <laughs> was how, how do you get this generated? Now, is this, is this, um, you can't take it from the original image, I don't think. You can't take uh, it from your, so, because uh, what I had assumed you were doing uh, originally was you're taking uh, the nooks and crannies, as, uh, as you called them, were, were specified in the object file, and that you were maybe once processing what the normal vectors were and then storing a some storing them somewhere in memory for for later use it sounds like you're you're not doing that you're using this normal map which is that work already done yeah so my question yeah, is where so, does it come from <laughs> uh so so this like generating these which we call like, these are assets right generating these assets have been completely separate from your program separate from your graphics pipeline, uh, people use uh, like, you know, side tools, like 3D, uh, 3D art tools. Like uh, you can think of like Blender, Maya, um, these like mm. big, uh, you know, these big software to uh, create models. And then they typically have features that, from my understanding, I actually haven't really used it. They have features that can like export textures in different ways. They can export it like this they can also, you can actually, in some, some versions, I think, you can like ask them to calculate normals and generate a texture map like this. The, the way I, I'm I sort of modeling this in my head is, this is like if I open a, a standard graphics painting package and I open, I look at the brush menu, I've got textured brushes. I'm I'm understanding they might, they have textured brushes for a visual texture, but they might have textured brushes as it were for the, the normal texture. Yeah. <laughs> so you could, you could you could generate these using some kind of predefined um, 
uh, patterns for for normal for generating normal maps of typical surfaces, as it were. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I gotta be honest, no, that, with, that's, yeah, that's, that's what's honest in my head. <laughs> no, I, I gotta be honest. With, that's kind of what's in my head as well. Again, like I just I just took these assets from from this uh, tutorial, so I didn't I didn't find it or generate it my own. I didn't draw this, um, so I just have to assume that three artists are able to generate it like this. I'm actually very curious if there's any viewers like if they could uh, tell us. But like, but yeah, from my understanding, there's there's like a in, in my head, there's like a magical button you press in these in these in these programs. It just says, "Okay, I, let me calculate all these uh, all these normals for you," and voila, <laughs> you've got your texture map. Uh, yeah. So, wow. So we've talked so much just about this one image. Uh, so uh, there's not. Uh, so let's talk about uh, real real quick just the code. Um, the when you when you send things to your graphics card, every graphics card has something called a rendering pipeline. The rendering pipeline has stages on which like certain things are expected to occur at each one of these stages, because the whole point of the graphics rendering pipeline is to determine for like a given window for every pixel in that window, determine what color that pixel is supposed to be. And then all that color colors for the for that window needs to go into something called a frame buffer, which is what actually ends up getting used to send to the uh, to your game and to your to your window. A uh, a rendering pipeline kind of looks like this. Um, I have this because I'm actually writing a blog post about about this as well, uh, but. There's this, and by the way, for for the experts that might be watching, um, this this is a very dumbed down version of what actually happens. This is just what's in my brain, uh, so take that for what you will. There's like so each one of these is a stage in the rendering pipeline. It goes from the very first stage called the vertex shader, and it flows through until it reaches the frame buffer. Uh, at each one of these stages, it begins with like. All the triangles, all the data, all the texture details, all that all that information is mapped to memory. You have to map manually map that to memory, uh, and then from stage to stage to stage, each all, all those all those data is being transformed over and over and over again until it is finally deduced reduced down into basically for this pixel right here, is it red or is it supposed to be blue? Like that's really all that all this this whole thing is trying to do. Okay, so how does this happen? Um, in my code, uh, there's a, uh, so I'm using something called uh, a graphics API. Uh, you need a graphical API because uh, when you write code in Rust, for example, you're, you're actually, your program's running on your CPU. So you need a way to actually talk to your GPU. The way to do that is through a graphics API. I'm using something called WGPU. It's a web GPU. Uh, it's there's like the, the the canonical ones that everyone's familiar with is like OpenGL, uh, Direct Direct 3D on Microsoft, Metal on on Apple. Uh, I'm using something called Web GPU. The reason why I picked that is like a whole other discussion. I don't know if we have time to talk about <laughs> that at length. Uh, but but yeah, here's this is where I create like a rendering pipeline. There's this function that I wrote called a render pipeline, and I'm using I'm using the API to define, to describe what my render pipeline should look like. I define what my vertex shader is. I define what this fragment shader is. And then there's some like configuration for everything that happens in here and some things that happen in here, not really. Um, and so- So when you, just just on the, when you say you define what they are, I notice you're, you're calling it a, it looks like a programmable stage descriptor. Is this a? Is this just like a function that gets run? Is this um, what? How do you? How are those defined? Uh, okay. In, in my so, head, when I when I see this this programmable section, I'm thinking, ah, oh, yeah, pass it a function. It'll call the function, but that doesn't. I don't think that's what you're doing because you're you're passing off this work to the graphics graphics rendering pipeline, aren't you? Um. 
So you're passing the, yeah, you're, in a way you're passing it off, but you're still telling it what it needs to do. Uh, let me explain what, that, what I mean by that. So in each one of these stages, they can be either programmable, they could be configurable, or they could be fixed. Fixed means like the hardware does it, the hardware manufacturer sets up what, what it does. There's nothing you can do to change its behavior. Configurable means you still can't change its behavior, but you can like configure it to maybe change slightly. And programmable means uh, exactly what you might think. It can change drastically according to what you want it to do. And you have to write something called a shader program, which is set again, separate from your application program. A shader program uses a shader language. Uh, this is what it might look like. This is my vertex shader. And um, I don't want to get into exactly what all of this does necessarily, but the idea is that for a vertex shader, there's a like a very strictly defined um, there's a strictly defined uh, like API or contract where the vertex shader for every time it's called, it's expected to receive exactly one vertex, and you are expected to output some data shape, uh, which I think is another another like coordinate. Uh, and then a bunch of stuff happens in here, which I'm gonna just gloss over. And then the fragment shader is supposed to take something called fragments and determine what color it should be. So there's so there's like a there's a strictly defined like API contract at each one of these shaders, and you have to adhere to that. Uh, you basically write these programs, and then you can. This is literally in line. I am compiling that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what each line does, but I take the program files themselves, load them in, compile them, co compile them into a um, into a module, which is basically just a bunch of bytes, and I send those bytes to the uh, to the to the graphics card, and my graphics card through the graphics API will know. Oh, this is a this is a shader program. I should make sure I set it somewhere where I can, I can actually invoke it like a program. Does that make sense? That, that makes a lot of sense actually is, is the, um, essentially packaging up your, your shader or in this case, in the first, first step of the pipeline, the shader in mm -hmm. a language that is specific to writing that, how that shader should behave. But I think the thing that really cemented it for me was you talk about that contract of, um, this will be called, it will provide this vertex and you are expected to respond with a particular defined response. So, so that, that, that really does make sense to me is, is that kind of packaging up the, the functional, the steps that need to happen, compiling it and just handing it off to the, the graphics pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this graphics pipeline is, is defined and I'm going to kind of skip to the end here. There's a, I have a, like, I have a render function. Uh, let me find it. Which this is the this is the render function. There's uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening here with getting a swap chain frame and the and an, an encoder. Which like an encoder is like a is an abstraction that like helps you um, create commands to send to the graphics card. These commands could be things like I want you to take all these bytes from this texture map and load it into a buffer into memory. On the graphics card, it could be something like the, the most important ones. Like I want you to start drawing, like start the like start um, start doing what I want you to do. Uh, there's this thing called a render pass, which uh, which is that like start drawing command. And um, in this here at the very end, it's all kind of like abstracted away. Uh, you kind of set the pipeline with the with the kind of like the descriptors, like for what that pipeline's supposed to look like. And then you call draw, and with the draw you pass in all these information. So the obj model is like the is all that data from from this OBJ file. And this is the uh, the vertices definition that you showed us at the beginning. Correct. Yeah. And then like there's this thing called the uniform bind group. Uh, I don't know if we have time, but basically it's it's just additional data things like. Uh, things like the light source or things like um, the location of that light source. Um, there's also this light bind group, which also stores light information, uh, confusingly enough. Um, 
Yeah, and then I, I draw, I, I actually call draw twice, one for the light and one for the for the cube. So on every every time through this loop, ultimately these get called and then uh, it's, in, it's put into this encoder object, which again, an encoder just like contains like the, the commands in a format that the GPU can understand. And then I submit the commands to what they call the like the the GPU queue, which is um, it's like a queue of commands that the that the graphics card needs to start like like processing through one by one. Uh, so it it's as you you called it earlier the pipeline as it were. So you're just chucking stuff in at the front, and you're then yeah. letting it run with those. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much like the, the the best way that I've heard somebody describe it is like. The, your video, your game engine is just responsible for shoveling a whole bunch of like heaps and heaps and heaps of data, of vertex vertexes and normal maps and stuff to the graphics card, and just letting the shaders do its thing. Just shovel it all over and tell it what to tell it to start drawing. And and if you wrote these shaders correctly, and if you trust in this this pipeline, and you adhere to the contract, uh, you get um, you get the pretty pictures out. <laughs> Yeah, there's, um, we're coming up to time actually, but there's there's, there's so much more I want to ask. Yeah, <laughs> you started off. We started off with a, what um, I hope I'm not doing it a disservice by calling it um, what looks like a rather simple picture. And 20, 30 years ago, that was not a simple picture. But if you've grown up used to uh, graphics that you see on like portable devices like phones these days, um, something what like a a light source revolving or sort of orbiting a cube, a textured cube might might come across as that's that's just normal, right? We expect that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you've kind of you've kind of peeled back the you've peeled back the layers, and, and now I'm just I'm sitting here going the next if we had another hour to talk, um, <laughs> I'd be asking about debugging, right? Because the moment you start packaging this stuff up and dropping it onto the graphics card, and and then I'm assuming that maybe the first time you do this, you get garbage out the other end and it's like, where do you go? <laughs> so it's, a, it's clearly a, a whole, a whole other rabbit hole that we could go down. Um, but yeah, given, given that we're sort of coming up to time, is there anything you wanted to, to sort of cover off in the last couple of minutes? Um, I just want to share some, some materials that if there's anybody out there who's also interested in this stuff uh, that they can start with, uh, I kind of alluded it, alluded to it, um, you know, in my, you know, at the, at the introductions, there's uh, the, the most like important book for me has been this book, which is uh, Game Engine Architecture uh, by Jason Gregory. Uh, this guy worked at Naughty Dog, I, I believe. Uh, so like Last of Us, those, you know, those guys, uh, amazing, amazing, amazing. And then this book is called uh, Mathematics. Uh, this is like, this helps help me for understanding a lot of those that that normal disc discussion and like what exactly is happening with the light. Uh, that stuff is super useful. Uh, and if, if people couldn't see the video there, those are, those are two chunky books. <laughs> they're not small, they're not small five minute reads. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, and then um, there's this, there's this, um, you know, website here. Uh, there's a user that goes by S O T R H. I, I don't know how to pronounce that, but uh, yeah, he's, he wrote this and, and it, it is amazing. Um, at least if you, especially if you want to code, you know, a graphics um, program in, in Rust, this is amazing uh, for that. Uh, there's also another website that if people are interested in, it's called uh, Scratch a Pixel. Uh, learn computer graphics from scratch. And I think they focus on OpenGL as a graphics library, but, uh, but yeah, there's like a whole, Bunch of information. I think they're still writing it. There's like so much to, to graphics. Uh, there's and it begins with all the foundations like geometry. What the heck is a point and a vector and a normal? What is a coordinate system? Uh, you know, like things like things like this. It's a it's an amazing resource. Uh, man, I could keep going, but uh, I guess those are the most important ones that I've used to learn. And so, if anybody's interested in learning, uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, I, I don't know if I can be helpful, but I can try. Uh, or you can like find these resources and, and, and learn on your own like, like I am. 
I think you, you touched on a, a really good way to end there, which is learning, because it feels like everything that you've touched on the on the journey is really a kind of just a another cover, another door that needs to be opened, and that there's more behind it, and you can keep going <laughs> and keep going and keep going. The rabbit, the rabbit hole um, never ends. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Chris. Um, it's been it's been Thanks really, really good to go through this. I'm I'm left thinking, uh, where have I got a few months to spare to to pick up this journey? <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's so many disciplines that come together in this, and it 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 it's yes, there's a tutorial, but there's so much behind it. So it's been it's been really, really good to see uh, to see that. Um, I guess I'll just wrap up then by uh, I guess once again thanking thanking our sponsors for Co Buddies. So uh, Netlify, uh, GitDuck, and DigitalOcean, and um, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, it's been it's been really good to to see this and and really well presented. I now feel educated in the world of three D graphics. Uh, thanks for having me, Bill. I'm just I'm just happy to talk about my project. So, thanks. <laughs>